For many years, there has been a phrase echoed across the world since the early centuries. Jesus Christ is coming again. Parents have said it to their children. Their parents has also said it to them. And to this day, because Jesus has not returned, to many it's become a meaningless saying, to the point that there are some who mock others who believe Jesus Christ is coming again. But first you must realise that in the last days, some people won't think about anything except their own selfish desires. They will make fun of you and say, didn't your Lord promise to come back? Yet the first leaders have already died and the world hasn't changed a bit. They will say this because they want to forget that long ago the heavens and the earth were made at God's command. At most, it seems that today we have come to an emotional standpoint of scripture rather than following a simple thus saith the Lord. Because you have to make sure what you say and what you do match up. You understand? Okay, so we gonna cover up, right? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. She's not going to cover up. She's going to wear what she want to wear in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 She's going to wear what she wants to wear in the name of Jesus. Yes, she will. Yes, she will. And what that has done is caused teachings like the second coming of Christ to be cheapened and almost nullified. And this spirit has not only reached the Christian world, but even the secular world as they post erroneous versions of biblical films. And even on the side of atheism, though evolution is just a theory and cannot disprove the facts of theism, they have established their theory as fact and mock those of faith in the process. Would dream of saying. Let's call it evil. Where does evil come from? Religion. <laughs> And, and to, are, answer, uh, to answer your next question, morality comes from humanism and is stolen by religion. Due to this, the reality of the times we are in proves that there has not only been a decline in morality as well as spirituality and in society, but there has been an increase of self-spirituality. Oh, know what their spiritual side is. That's good. Not talking about religion. I am a Christian, that is my faith. I'm not asking you to be a Christian. If you want to be one, I can to show you To the point how. that the peculiar character of biblical faith has almost become obliterated. There is an inspired key principle that we all must adhere to. For we have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. Now this is nothing new for we commonly teach our children the same things in the principles of life that they make not the same mistakes as we did, as well as others in the specific areas of life. For we say these things in order to warn, exhort and educate for information of what's to come. The Bible also expresses things like this in this nature with phrases like remember Lot's wife, as it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Lot, there is no new thing under the sun and all these things were written for in samples and are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The whole point of the matter is simply this, there is a time when Jesus Christ is going to come again and the specific historically proven signs indicate just how close we are to the end of all things. And these signs are to show us not only what's to come, but how to prepare our hearts, our minds and our souls that we are ready for what's to come. Jesus Christ gave us an example of the parable with the wise and the foolish virgins. Though the wise and the foolish virgins knew that a marriage was to happen, one group was ready for the wedding while the other was lost. And so prophecy is a gift. Not just to prove the existence of God, for it says in Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9 and 10, Remember the first events, because I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. From the beginning I reveal the end. From long ago I told you things that had not yet happened, saying, My plan will stand, and I'll do everything I intended to do. John chapter 14, 29 also echoes this by saying, I'm telling you this now 
before it happens. When it does happen, you will believe. Now this verse is very special to me because this is what caused me to become a Christian. But the purpose of it all is to now express what the actual moral purpose of prophecy is all about. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, where unto you do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And according to Revelation chapter 22 verse 16, the day star is none other than Jesus Christ. And so the purpose of prophecy is for Christ to be in our hearts, which the Bible expresses in Colossians chapter 1 verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So prophecy reveals that there will be a people ready for the coming of Jesus Christ and will also have complete victory over sin because Christ is now reigning in your heart. Prophecy has never been about a doomsday event as mentioned in the media and portrayed just in order to get a quick dollar or a quick pound. Prophecy is the gospel because Jesus Christ is the foundation of the prophecy. And so in the next series of videos we are going to apply the principle that we read in Isaiah chapter 46. Because in order to bring meaning to the statement, Jesus Christ is coming again, we must know where we are and let prophetic events guide us that we know Jesus is coming for sure very soon. In the days of Paul, they believed Jesus Christ was coming soon, but he mentioned that there had to be a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed which is the Antichrist power. Now we beseech you brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What Paul is describing is what is to happen in the very near future. Jesus Christ also expresses that he won't come again until the everlasting gospel has gone throughout the whole world. And this everlasting gospel is found in the book of Revelation chapter 14, which we are going to talk about in this series. And the events which transpire in the everlasting gospel includes the event which Paul mentioned which highlights the actual power that holds the mark of the beast. And so when we see the events come to pass, we can now bring to life the statement, Jesus Christ is coming again. And so friends, I encourage you to share these imperative video series which we are going to go through, share it with believers as well as non-believers that they may have an opportunity to know the truth. And as we know that time is coming to its close, we at POTS Ministries ask that you support us with your means, your prayers and your support with whatever the Lord impresses you to give, that we may have more time to produce videos like these quicker and effectively in relation to what is happening in today's generation. You may not be able to do much, but you can surely aid in much that the work of the harvest has more laborers. I encourage you with this inspired quote which says, the message must go notwithstanding the hard times. We must make special efforts in this direction now while the angels are holding the four winds. Soon the time to labor will be past. Who does not want to have a part in this closing work? All can do something. And the key is this, those who cannot give themselves can give of their means. Pray brethren, Pray earnestly that the hearts of some who are doing very little and of others who have as yet done nothing may be opened and that the means that the Lord has entrusted to them may be used to his glory. The work begun in weakness will be carried on to a glorious termination. The truth must go to all nations, tongues and peoples 
and that speedily. And so friends, with that said, let us now begin our series from Daniel to the Sunday Law. In the book of Daniel chapter 2, Daniel and his friends as well as the nation of Israel are taken captive by the Babylonians because Israel as a whole rejected the Lord, forsook his commandments and went after their own ways. A similar pattern is seen with the children of Israel when they rebelled against God time and time again and this is all recorded in the book of Judges where they sinned and then they called out for God and God sent them judges to be saved only to repeat this process. Now during the time of Babylon, Daniel and his friends, after being proved of their worth in Daniel chapter 1 by not eating of the king's meat and therefore displaying their skill, vitality and understanding, are under threat by the same nation who proved themselves worthy, and that is Babylon. And we see this in Daniel chapter 2. The king of Babylon had a dream which troubled him to the core and could not even get the meaning of his dream because he had forgotten. Even by his own Chaldeans, his own wise men and sorcerers, they did not even understand nor could they even come to understand what the dream meant. And due to this, the command was given. For this cause the king was very angry, very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men in Babylon, which included Daniel and his friends. As Daniel hears of this hasty decree, he requests time and prayers that the God of heaven may answer, give him the answer that he may display to the king. And indeed, God who always comes through for the faithful answers the prayer. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And so the Bible reveals that this dream relates to us today. For the dream is to tell us what is to happen in the latter days. The word latter in the Latin means last. Therefore, this dream is to affect those who are living in the last days. The dream that Nebuchadnezzar had was of an image, which starts with a head of gold, then chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. We are then told that there is a stone cut without hands out of a mountain and destroys the image from the foot, destroying it all the way to the top. That same stone then fills the whole earth and the vision comes to its end. And so the question that must be asked amongst all of us is simply this. What does this vision have to do with us living in today, 2017, coming up to 2018? Well, according to history, the head of gold represented Babylon. The chest and arms of silver represented the Medes and the Persians who succeeded Babylon. The belly and thighs of brass represented the Greeks which succeeded the Medes and the Persians. And the legs of iron represented the Roman pagans which succeeded Greece. The historian Edward Gibbons who wrote The Decline and the Fall of the Roman Empire 1776 to 1788 states this. The images of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. And so we are left with one last element. The toes and the miry clay represents the nations of Rome that were divided. We will explain this as we go along in Daniel chapter 7. But the characteristics of the iron and the miry clay in its primary application represents the apostate people and the state. Now we're not talking about God's people or God's church as this is represented as potter's clay, but rather we are talking about miry clay which is you could say the apostate church. But now O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. 
this is represented as God's people. But the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is returned to his own vomit again, and the soul that was washed to her wallowing in the mire, therefore representing the wicked people. And the final part of the interpretation of the vision is that that stone that is cut without hand represents a kingdom that belongs to God, which is not done with human intervention, the kingdom of God, because it is cut without hands. And so the Lord shows the revelation of the dream and the interpretation, and this is specifically for the latter last days. And so the question is, where are we in the image of Daniel chapter 2? Where are we located in this image? Friends, we are in the time of the feet of iron and clay, and the stone coming to destroy the image. According to history, we know that Babylon is past, the Medes and the Persians are past, Greece is past, pagan Rome is past, the divided nations of Europe is past, but church and state at this moment in time is being set in motion. And we then also know that the stone that is cut without hands has not yet come to pass, which means we are in between the toes of the image and the stone. And so the question that is to be asked between each and every one of us is how can we be prepared to be part of that kingdom instead of being destroyed with the image when the stone hits the image? Let's find out as the Bible begins to repeat and expand this portion of the prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel is in vision, and this vision is of beasts in their nature which characterizes the kingdoms it represents. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. Based upon the flow of Daniel chapter 2 that we've gone through, we already know that these kingdoms are to be Babylon, Media Persia, Greece and Rome. And the Bible emphasizes that the events that are to take place in the image has a focused attention on what's to come to pass in the latter days. And so we are to expect the same in Daniel chapter 7 as it repeats and expands Daniel chapter 2. But the more detail or expansion of the prophecy is in the events that happen between the toes and the stone. So let's see what the Bible says and what it is opened up in the last portion of the beast in Daniel chapter 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now from what we studied in Daniel chapter 2, we know that this beast is symbolized as none other kingdom than Rome. And the fourth shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Now all the while throughout this prophecy it has come to the attention of Daniel to look into the actions and characteristics of the fourth beast. For it says in verse 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, 
and a mouth speaking great things. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And so why is Daniel so fascinated by this horn that is on the fourth beast, which he is looking with great admiration, consideration? What did this beast do in order for it to have such power over nations, even have the power expressed in the following verses? For the Bible expresses that this is what it was able to do. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So according to prophecy, this horn was able to make war against the saints of God. Not only war against them, but to prevail against them, which is another way to say gain victory over them. This power destroyed God's people until the time came for God's kingdom to be ready. This is how disastrous and effective they were. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. This is essentially saying that the ten horns that were on the fourth beast, three of them were to be plucked up by the roots by this special horn you could say. This is to say that three kingdoms could not stand up against this horn that had them totally annihilated as characterized as being plucked up by the roots. And finally the Bible also says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, and times, and the dividing of time. Now according to the Bible, to speak words against is synonymous as speaking words of blasphemy or speaking in a way to make yourself above the person or thing that you are speaking of. Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemy words against Moses and against God, and set up false witnesses which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemy words against this holy place and the law. Therefore this little horn, whoever he is, is blaspheming against the Most High himself. But in which way does he blaspheme the Most High? Well in order to blaspheme God, or in this case set yourself above God, one must be able to commit or do the same attributes as the one that you are blaspheming against. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. And one of the biggest forms of blasphemy is verse 25, which says, he thinks to change times and laws. When God has already established his law because he is the almighty God, the moral standard giver and his law is just the same characteristics as who he is, a transcript of the character of God. The next attribute of the little horn is that they wear out the saints. As mentioned in verse 21, this horn makes war with the saints, this power persecutes the people of God and is then given into the hands of the little horn for a time, times and half a time. And so the question is how long, according to the biblical account of time, is a time, times and half a time? The word time translated in the original Hebrew is a year. So a year would be a time. Times would be two years, and half a time would be half a year. Calculated that together, and you get three and a half years, which is 1,260 days, for there is 360 days in a Jewish year. Now friends, that might sound like a very long time, 
But that's not even the length of time according to the interpretation of Bible prophecy. After the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquity. Even 40 years, ye shall know my breach of promise. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side. And thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So now instead of 1260 days, this power is to reign for 1260 years, persecuting God's people, reigning as a power claiming to be God, having the power to uproot three kings, even being diverse from all the other beasts, and even attempt to change the law of God. And more so for us to understand who this power is, this power must come out of Rome, for the horns came out of the fourth beast. Now when you connect all the dots together friends, this power points to none other than the Roman Catholic Church. When Rome was divided into 10 kingdoms, it uprooted 3 in order for it to have full reign. Those 10 horns were the 10 divided nations of Europe who were the Germans, the Swiss, the French, the Italians, the English, the Portuguese, the Spanish. And the final last 3 which were completely destroyed, the 3 nations that were plucked up by the Roman Catholic power, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths being destroyed in the year 538 AD. The papacy was also responsible during this time of the Dark Ages to be persecuting millions of Christians because they did not heed to the papal dogma. This spawned the time of what was known as the Protestant Reformation with individuals like Jerome, Huss, William Tyndale, John Wycliffe and of course Martin Luther. The papacy also fulfills this prophecy because it changes the law of God, changing times and laws. When you look into history, the papal church changed the day, the Sabbath day, the day that God established as holy, as holy as himself, from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week because of a sense of their own power. They also changed and took out the commandment of thou shalt have no graven images. But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will find not a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scripture enforced the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in a reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Nowhere in the Bible is it stated that worship should be changed from Saturday to Sunday. Now the church instituted by God's authority Sunday as a day of worship. This same church by the same divine authority taught the doctrine of purgatory long before the Bible was made. We have therefore the same authority for purgatory as we have for Sunday. No man may enter into the kingdom unless he is led by the sovereign pontiff and only if they be united to him can men be saved. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change Saturday to Sunday was her act and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious matters. Sunday is our mark or authority. The Church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. The priest does not only declare that the sinner is forgiven, but he really forgives him. So great is the power of the priest that the judgments of heaven itself are subjected to his decision. 
don't go to God for forgiveness of sins, come to me. The little horn in Daniel chapter 7 is the Roman Catholic Church and the reason why it is also stated as being diverse from all the other beasts is because this is the only nation, the only kingdom that was a religious power as well as a political power. The Catholic Church fulfills all the characteristics both in nature and prophecy and the reason why it is imperative for us to hold on to the understanding of these identifying marks is because it will help us understand the mark of the beast as we now head into Revelation chapter 13. For Revelation 13 now begins to repeat and enlarge the same way Daniel chapter 7 repeated and enlarged Daniel chapter 2.